Good evening, everybody. Good to see everybody back tonight. Was that too loud? Somebody said, ooh, I guess it was too loud. <laughs> oh, woo excited, good. All right. Well, we are glad to see everybody tonight. We've got a good group tonight. So we're going to turn to page 543, or you can see the words on whichever side it's on. Oh, they're on both. Okay. So we're going to stand. Yes, Miss Tina? Oh. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right, we're going to stand and sing when the roll is called up yonder. Would you like to open us up in prayer, please? <clears throat> Amen. All right, so now we're going to turn. Y'all can sit down. Y'all don't have to stand the whole time. Y'all can sit down. We're going to turn to page 554, and we're going to sing all three verses. We're going to sing I'll Fly Away. Nobody knows this song, but, you know, just hang on. We'll get through it. <laughs> <laughs>
blessed to have Brother Jerry Toddy back tonight, and he's going to bring us number four, right? The fourth type of person. So see which person you are between last Sunday and this Sunday, and we would love to have Brother Jerry come back up and share with us. Testing one, two. All right, we're on. All right, welcome back. So we have been uh, going through a really a, a four-part series on Psalm 107, and uh, I said this morning this is really the first time I think I, I can ever remember preaching on the uh, Psalms, much less doing an entire series on uh, on on one Psalm. But I hope it's been as good for you as it, is, as it has been for me. And the last two Sundays we've talked about. Uh, the fact that God's love does not change. And his love for you is still as abounding for you when your circumstances grow challenging. And when it gets difficult and the skies darken and become harder, his love endures forever. And that those who were lost and in terrible circumstances, very difficult, once they become redeemed of the Lord and once they come home to the Lord, one of the things that they cannot get over is the love of God that he has for them. And that's one of the things when people are born again, that they, when they experience the love of God, the forgiveness and the mercy and the amazing grace of God, that, that, and they know God personally. Um, and let me just, let me just take a, a time out here for just a second. I'm not here to talk to you about religion. I'm here to talk to you about a living, dynamic, personally growing relationship with the one true living God. Listen, you can go to any, you can go to a Muslim, uh, you can go to a worship service, you can go to a synagogue, you can go to uh, Buddhism, and all. you can experience religion in all kinds of ways, but there's only one way to God, and that is through Jesus Christ that died for your sins. You know why? I, I can make this very, very simple, because God is holy, and, and for you, for the Holy Spirit to be living inside of you, you have to be holy too. To, to be a vessel of the living God, you have to be holy too. Well, how do you a, a sinful creature become holy. You have to have all of your sins washed away. And the only way to do that is the blood of Jesus Christ that will make your sins, though they are scarlet, as white as snow. <laughs> Amen. Amen. So these people throughout Psalm 107 have, have been found, they've, they've run out of options, and when their life is just about over, finally, as a last resort, they cry out to God. They're in a terrible, sinless, godless place. Their life is pretty much over. And then somehow, as a result of their rebellion, they ended up in this terrible place. They've lost all hope. And, and then God heals them. God sets them free. And, and of all the crazy things, for once in these people's lives, they, they are ready to let the Lord God lead them. And what a remarkable thing it is for people who have been all these different things and terrible things, their lives have been a total mess for them to, first of all, let the Lord God lead them. I said this this morning, Proverbs 9, 10, fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Now, we've looked at three different groups of people, three different scenarios, three different groups of people that were in this life, were in very bad shape, terrible places. Finally, they look up. So this evening, we're going to talk about the fourth group of people, and I think that the fourth group of people will more or less mimic a lot of the people in this room. And honestly, this is probably the scariest, the most frightening of the groups of people. Let's go there. Are you with me? Let's go to the Lord in prayer first. Lord, here, here we are all gathered here in the name of Jesus. Lord, I lift up the people, the first people that first of all 
are going through a really difficult place. It's a hard place. They may feel like they are being beaten on by the world or by their family or by their circumstances or their situation. Their circumstances have gone from difficult to hard to unbearable. And they feel like they are in the middle of a storm right now and they cannot get out of it. I pray for those that are in the far country. I pray for those that are walking with you that need to lead other people home. That, that we would be available to do what you've called us to do for these groups of people that you place into and around our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. I'm going to ask you. I'm going to ask you again. <laughs> did you did you bring your app? Did you bring your Bible with you to church this evening? You got it? You got your app? Okay. What is it? Gives the devil a headache when you bring your Bible to church and actually makes him nauseated when you actually learn something from it. So we're going to learn something from it. So go ahead and open up to Psalm 107. We're going to start off in verse 23. Psalm 107, verse 23. I want to tell you, first of all, that these people are just seem to be kind of going through life. They're, they're, they're doing their job. They're going about their business. Life is running along just fine. Maybe by their occupation. These are a courageous group of people. They don't scare easily. What scares you? What frightens you? Are you courageous? Do you trust the Lord in all things that are scary and, and frightening? Do you worry about your family? Do you worry about your health? Do you worry about your finances? What is it that you're afraid of? Yeah, amen for that. Okay, so here we go. Psalm 107, verse 23, and we're going to go through 32. Some went out on the sea in ships. They were merchants on the mighty waters. They saw the works of the Lord, his wonderful deeds in the deep. For he spoke and stirred up a tempest that lifted high the waves. They mounted up to the heavens and went down to the depths. In their peril, their courage melted away. They reeled and staggered like drunkards. They were at their wit's end. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he brought them out of their distress. He stilled the storm to a whisper, and the waves of the sea were hushed. They were glad when it grew calm, and he guided them to their desired haven. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love, for his wonderful deeds for mankind. Let them exalt him in the assembly of the people and praise him in the council of the elders. So here we have merchants they're just going along um, doing their business, trying to support their families. They bought, they traded, whatever their, their business required. They traveled across great bodies of water. And I like that they were merchants more than, than they were fishermen. I like that, that explanation better. Some, some commentaries kind of said both. But we don't really know what they traded. But they were kind of like, in that day, 18-wheeler drivers taking, you know, merchants and trading and bringing and this, this sort of thing. It doesn't really say anything about their rebellion against the word of God or against the Lord. All we're really told is that they were doing their jobs, probably trying to feed their family. It also says in verse 24 that they saw the works of the Lord and his wonderful deeds in, in, 
in the deep. But who is it that stirs up this storm? It's the Lord. And it doesn't say anything that, uh, that would say that they really deserve this or, or it be, this, this happened because of their rebellious attitude about the Lord. They're just really going about it, doing their job. It even says, you know, they saw the works of the Lord. They recognized that. They, they acknowledge that. And God stirs up this storm right in the And you can imagine a ship, a wooden boat at, at this particular time. And um, he stirs up this thing. As a matter of fact, I looked it up. And now that we've got satellites and, and, and meteorological buoys and this sort of thing, the largest wave ever recorded out in the middle of the ocean, just a wave, take a guess, six, six stories tall, six stories tall from a meteorological buoy. And then uh, the largest wave sighted from a, uh, another ship, nine stories tall. So there were, there were big waves, and you can tell that what, what they're talking about is they're talking about these waves. They mounted up. They went, I feel like they went so high they went up to heaven and they went down in the depths. And they're in a wooden vessel. Now, why would the Lord direct this storm right towards these people? Why would the Lord do that? I mean, I mean it scared these good people. You know, uh, some people say, well, well, it was an occupational hazard. Some people say, you know, they're, they're out in the middle of nowhere, in the middle, middle of this storm. And some people say, would say, well, now, now watch this now. Some people would say, well, that's the God of the Old Testament. And the God of the New Testament, Jesus, he really wouldn't do something like that. There's a difference between the God of the Old Testament and Jesus in the New Testament. You heard this before? That's exactly right. You're getting ahead of me. But that's okay. That's good. I like that. All right. So... So yeah, if you're, if you're questioning this, I want you to turn over to Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4, verse 30. I don't think Jesus would carry people out in the middle of a storm and make them fearful and for nothing. I just don't think Jesus would do that. Okay, Mark chapter 4, verse 30. And I'm, I'm actually going to back up and I'm going to read you uh, a, a little bit of the context here. Mark chapter 4, verse 30. Now watch this. And again, he said, this is Jesus. And again, he said, what shall we say? The kingdom of God is like, or a, par or a parable shall we use to describe it. It's like a mustard seed, which is the smallest of all the seeds on the earth. Yet when planted, it grows and becomes the largest of all the uh, garden plants with such big branches that the birds can perch in its shade. With many si similar parables... Jesus spoke the word to them as much as they could understand. He did not say anything to them without using a parable. But when he was alone with his, with his own disciples, he explained everything. That day, that day, when evening came, so maybe it was getting toward to be dark, Jesus says, let's go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A furious squall came up, and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said, Teacher! Don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. When the wind died down and it was completely calm, he said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and ask each other, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. So look very, very closely at verse 35. Very, very closely at verse 35. 
in about seven simple little words when Jesus says, let us go over to the other side. Who was it that directed? They were already in a boat. Who was it that directed these people to get in the boat and go across the lake? It was Jesus. And who was it that was in the boat with him? His disciples. All of them. So why would Jesus lead his disciples right into the mouth of a storm? Why would he do that? Well, he gives us a little hint when he asks them two questions. He asked them two questions. His two questions are, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? So here they are. The waves are crashing over the boat. They could have been two or three miles from shore. The, the, the lake, uh, Gennesaret, or the Lake of Galilee, was at its widest point is eight miles apart. So they could have been, it could have been night. They could maybe they, they were so far away from shore they couldn't see. They're taking on water. Uh, uh, the waves are crashing over. They're in risk of sinking. And who was it that led them right there? Jesus did. And where is he? He's sleeping in the back. He's asleep. And you can sort of hear them saying, Teacher, don't you care for us? Do you not care anything about us? Can you not see we're about to drown? So they wake him up, and he calms them. That calms the whole storm. What did they do to earn this frightening experience. What did they do? The Bible doesn't really say, but they were obeying Jesus. When they got into the boat and they went across, they were following Jesus, and Jesus asked them two questions. Now, why would Jesus, who knows everything, already ask these men two questions that he already knows the answer to? Why, do, why does he do that? Do you, did you know that in the New Testament, you know how many questions Jesus is recording as asking in the New Testament? Take a guess. 307. 307. Well, let me, let me watch this now. Here is the greatest teacher in the history of the world, and he's asking questions. Do you know why? Because today, people know, and I believe this too, that you can make 10 times the impact by asking a thought-provoking, thought-engendering, engaging question so that people can learn and think for themselves and acknowledge for themselves, oh, that, oh, I, oh, I see what you're saying. He wants them to think about what's going on. He wants them to think about their fear, where their fear is coming from, and their faith. Because you know what? The two collide. Where one stops, the other one starts. Where one starts, the other one stops. So I ask you again, what, what are you afraid of? What do you find yourself, as you're going through this point in your life, most afraid of? These people in the boat, what were they afraid of? Their circumstances. Where were their eyes? In it? Their eyes were focused where? On the waves and the wind and the water and their circumstances. So let's, let's talk about this for a minute. So Jesus had been teaching his disciples maybe for a long time that day. And remember, he just called them to be his disciples in chapter 3, and we're just in chapter 4. So maybe he senses for some reason that their faith is really not where it needs to be. Their faith needs to come up to the next level. So maybe he's hearing them talk the previous day, and, and the, he senses that their eyes and ears are only on their circumstances, so he gives his disciples one simple command. Let's go across the lake to the other side. And what do they do? Think nothing about it. What does that tell you? You, we, could be going through life, following Jesus, obeying the Lord, normal set of circumstances, and all of a sudden, we are in a life or death serious problem. Serious problem. One minute we're following Jesus, the next minute our, our, our very life is at stake. 
Now let me ask you this. Do you think after this event, after it was over, do you think these men were thankful they went through this particular situation and they saw what they saw and they heard what they heard? I think they were. I think the greatest teacher in the history of the world knew exactly what they needed to take their faith to the next level. You, you let me give you another reason why I think that? Because this particular event is recorded in three out of the four Gospels. They talked about this for decades after this happened. So they're thankful for it, and the message is this. When Jesus needs to take your faith to a new level, don't be surprised if he leads you right into the mouth of a problem that you cannot deal with. It may be such a big problem where you're in fear of your very life. Your life is going to end for all you know it. That's what he does. And you know what I think the disciples would tell you? I think the disciples would tell you after going through like this, if they came in here and, and, and we had a chance to ask them about that, that event, how he stopped the storm, how he led you were out here and he was teaching, and then he said, let's go across the lake. And then this big storm comes. You know what I think they would tell all of us? Trust the storms in your life. He has the power and the ability to bring you through it. These storms and these problems and these predicaments are not to destroy you. He didn't, he didn't tell the disciples to go across, let's go across the other side of the lake to destroy them. He knew what they needed. They needed to take their faith to a different level. And so you see them, and, and by their reaction, was he right? He was 100% right. I mean, here they are with God himself creator of the waves and everything else, right there asleep. And what are they focused on? They're seeing all the waves coming over. They're seeing the water. They're seeing everything happen. Panic stricken. Where, where should their minds have been locked in on? Jesus. Not their circumstances, but understanding exactly who Jesus is. But that's not what they're looking at. All their eyes should have been but that's not what they are. So where do, what do we focus on when we're in the middle of a storm? The people. I can't believe she said that. Such a problem. Middle of a storm, our tendency is to focus on people, the circumstances that we're caught on. So let's, let's go back to our merchants for just a second. Let's go back to Psalm 107. Let's go back to our merchants. Psalm 107, verse 26. In their peril, their courage melted away. So they're surviving one wave, giant wave at a time. The next wave could be their end. The deck is, is so uh, throwing such around that they couldn't even walk. Uh, Matthew Henry, famous Bible commentary, said they were probably uh, throwing up. These guys had been through a lot. I mean, they were seasoned veterans. And, and here they are. They're buffalo. Everything they tried to do and nothing works. Nothing works. In fact, I didn't make this up. The Bible says they were at their what? They were at their wit's end. You hadn't, you, we don't hear that phrase much anymore. You know, my mom used to say that about me and my brother when we were teenagers and coming up. I'm at my wits end with you boys. You know what I'm talking about. But these guys had come to their thinking and all their logic couldn't help them. They, they, they couldn't help them. Matthew Henry, he says, when we're at our wits end, we're not at our faith's end. Somebody said of, of over 100 years ago when, 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 when sailors would go out, listen to this quote. Talking about sailors 100, 200, 300 years ago, they said, let those who go to sea learn to pray and be accustomed to praying. You know why? Back then in particular, they were probably going to need it. So now look at verse 28. Here's the turning point for these sailors. What is it? You see that? What did they do? They, then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble. Do you see the pattern here? You see the pattern? 
they cried out to the Lord in their trouble. In their trouble, and he brought them out of their distress. There's the turning point. He brought them to their desired haven. And then, look in verse 31. You see the same pattern repeating itself again and again and again. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love and his wonderful deeds for mankind. So, Sometimes by their behavior, they're just doing their jobs, every, everything's going normal, and all of a sudden, a terrible storm. And, I mean, they're at, absolutely at their wit's end. Sometimes people, by, by their sin and by their rebellion, they get into all these circumstances, but they all had to come to the end of themselves. It's just like I was saying this morning, hallelujah for the brokenhearted. Hallelujah when the skies turn dark. Hallelujah when people are falling apart. Because you know what? That's when the sun really comes through. That's when the sun really comes through. So they, the focus is, is on the unchanging love of God during difficult times and, and responding with eyes of faith instead of Jesus, you know, don't you care about me? Do you not see what I'm going through? And you know, when we are going through a storm, a tragedy, some difficult set of circumstances, do you know what Jesus said about us? going through very difficult circumstances? I'm going, to let him read. I'm going to let him read it to you. Turn over to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. I'm going to let him teach you. Matthew chapter 7, verse 24. We're all sort of building our lives as we go through. Matthew chapter 7, verse 24. Listen to his teaching about problems and difficulties in these storms of life. Therefore, everyone who hear these, hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house. Yet it did not fall because it had the foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them act into, into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. You know what storms do? They reveal the foundation. They reveal the foundation. You know, I, sometimes, you know, you may be in a place or, or you may have been in a place and, 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 and I think about the description here, the rains and the wind beat against that house. If you live long enough at some point in your life, you're going to feel like you're just getting pummeled all the time. Uh, problems and anxiety and situation. It feel, does it, you ever been through something like that? Where you just feel like your house is just getting beat against all the time? Well, that, that's happened. And the solution as we talk about is to cry out to the Lord every single time. Cry out to the Lord. So, but I, I've got to make this final point. And you've got to see this. If you don't hear anything else I say, there's a P.S. on this passage that if you're really wise and if you're really in Christ, you've got to hear this. So turn back over to Psalm 107 and look at the very last verse in this chapter. I'm going to summarize everything we've talked about last week, this week, this morning in this one verse. Listen to this. Let the one who is wise heed these things. What things? The things that we've been talking about in this chapter. And ponder the loving deeds of of the Lord. Let me just read let me just read that again. Let the one who is wide heed. Wait a minute, stop. Stop what you're doing. Think about what you're hearing. Think about what you've heard. Think about what you're listening to. Stop heed these things and think about. Just think about the loving deeds of the Lord. You know, he's he's big enough to handle our problems. He's good enough to know that 
that when we go through these valleys of suffering and difficult times, it's the great love of the Lord that we can depend on in all these situations. He loves us. He has only our best interests in mind. He uses all these things, and he's very able to bring us through all these things into a safe shelter. Do you believe this, church? Do you trust the Lord to bring you through it? You know, words are one thing, but putting your faith into action when you're in the middle of that squall and when you're in the middle of that boat and your boat's taking on water and you feel like you're underneath that swimming pool barely able to get a breath, scrambling to breathe and survive. It's tough to, to think about and be calm, but that's what, that's what we could do. Think about those disciples. If they were in that boat in the middle of that storm and they just stopped and said, hey guys, remember who we've got in this boat with us. Jesus is here, the son of the living God. And they just stopped and all sat down in the boat and just, just, just stared at Jesus and said, Jesus, we trust you. You know what? Then they wouldn't have needed that lesson. The question I have for you is, and really for me, because I'm thinking about this too, what about the next storm that we go through? And there will be a next storm. There will be a next challenge. You know, I don't, I don't care how old you are, God's not finished with you yet. And if he is still improving and working on you and your life, part of that is he's working on us to become the people we need to be so that he can use us in here and out there. Amen? Well, let's pray, shall we? Father, we thank you for the truth of your word. We thank you for the storms. We thank you for the brokenhearted. We thank you for the darkening skies. We thank you for the bad, when the bad times come that we can depend on you. We thank you for the good times. We, 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 just, we lift up your name in all circumstances. And Lord, help us when these sort of times come to be able to take our eyes off the circumstances, off the wind, off the waves, no matter how big, and to be steady and focused on you, your word, who you are, and your promises to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Sixty-six. I surrender all.